Welcome to KSOC Uncensored. On August 14th, the world watched as Fulton County, Georgia, District Attorney indicted Trump and his 18 co-defendants on 13 counts intruded, including an attempt to overturn the 2020 election. Today's guest, Martha Zoller, host of The Martha Zoller Show, owner of Insights in Georgia, longtime pundit, and much more, will help us better understand what we are seeing happen in Georgia and is Georgia now a swing state? Martha, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to be here. Oh, it's so great to have you on with your experience. I didn't even get to touch everything that you've done in your career. But the burning question is, we see a lot coming out of Georgia, especially Georgia's gotten a lot of attention from this indictment. We know that this is the Atlanta area, Fulton County. Not all Georgians are represented by this one county, and that is an understatement. But the burning question is, is Georgia now considered a swing state? What's your opinion on that? Well, I tell you what, uh, the money that's coming in here would imply that they think it's a swing state. But what they forget is that while the 2020 election was very close, the 2022 election, if you look at the governor and the secretary of state, they had handy um, Republican majorities at over 50 percent for both of them. And I will tell you that it is the goal of every Republican in Georgia to show the world in this election in 2024 that we are not a swing state. Now, we do have interesting demographics. And what I don't mean it in the traditional way is that you have roughly five and a half million people that live in the metropolitan Atlanta area. And that does swing Democrats. And there is roughly five and a half million people that live in the rest of Georgia outside of the 285 kind of kind of center area. So um, it is sort of the rural versus the urban. You see it in a lot of store, a lot of areas uh, throughout the country. And what really is the swing on that, if you want to call it a swing state, is what I like to call squishy Republican women who uh, tend to vote Republican. Uh, but have swung back and forth in the past. They voted for Clinton mm -hmm. one time, then they voted for Bush uh, one time, then they voted for Obama, then they voted for Trump, then they voted for Biden. And so you've got those voters that uh, you have to remember tend to vote Republican, but they they have to be won back every single cycle. Wow, that's exhausting. Imagine being married to one. I can't fathom. Never know. Are they going to want to stay married to me this week? I don't know. Maybe it'll change hot and hot and cold there for sure. Um, I know a lot of women in that just to touch on that topic a little more. Even my mom doesn't love Trump. He's offensive. I love that about him personally, but I'm just wired that way. So I can see where you're coming from. He doesn't work for everybody. Has there been any big change in Fulton County that would lead to this this change in, in voting in 20 and 22? Well, what's very interesting about Fulton County is it clearly still has a lot of Republican voters in sheer numbers. OK, there are you know several hundred thousand Republican voters that come out of Fulton County, but there's many more who are Democratic voters in Fulton mm -hmm. County. Fulton County used to be two counties. And now if you look at a map, it's it's you know, you've got two big land masses that are connected at the city of Atlanta and the northern part is very Republican. The southern part is very Democrat. And that's just kind of the way it is. But, um, you know, as far as, you know, you ask the question about your mom and I'm probably more your mom's age than I am your age that. You know, what was hard for us, and my dad was a New Yorker, so I voted for Trump twice. I gave him money in 2020, but I am looking at the field as a voter uh, in this primary because, uh, you know, my dad was a POW. And uh, even though I voted for Trump twice, I just felt he went a little too far in his language related to John McCain. Whether you like him or not, I mm. think that it went too far. And so, I think there are a lot of women out there, and I'm not a squishy Republican voter, but I am looking at the rest of the field. I will support whoever the Republican nominee is, but right. I'm kind of like your mom, that I, I'm looking at the other field because I love the policies, but wish that he could have been just a little more um, soft about certain things. Right, 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 definitely. No, I, I see that. There were some times that even myself, and I don't, Nothing really bothers me. But uh, even where I was like cringy, 
Like, let, all right, let's let's back up here, Trump. But uh, well, and let's yeah, look at it I like know. a political strategist. Let's look at right. it like a political strategist where where he's got his folks. Right. We, I think, have established that the people who are strong Trump supporters are going to be strong Trump supporters for him no matter what. Right. I would think right. everybody would agree with that. Any yeah. strategist, and this is what I do for a living, I try to help people get elected. I try to help conservatives get elected. Then what you do, once you have your base, what you try to do is bring along people that might be un unsure about you. And he even said himself in the interview with Brett Baer, he, when Brett Baer asked him this question about suburban women, he said, uh, you know, I know I need to moderate a little bit, but I just can't do it. So at least he was honest. <laughs> Self-awareness is worth a lot, actually. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I would agree. He's He's got that edge about him and he's definitely unfiltered. I want to ask, going back to the indictment, so this was done under the RICO Act, and for those not familiar, the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act out of Georgia. And, you know, really to be found guilty of this, I've taken notes here because it, there's quite a bit to go that goes into it. But I was looking at the extremes here. Uh, usually there has to be an element of wire or mail fraud, bribery, kidnapping, drug dealing, murder, and arson. It seems like quite the stretch for this to be what Trump has been indicted under. I mean, this is just one of them. What are your well, thoughts on the RICO Act? Bonnie Willis's first, this was Bonnie Willis's first mistake is going with the RICO. And I'm not mm. a lawyer, but I've done a lot of reading on this and I've had a lot of lawyers come on, Democrat and Republican lawyers, and explain this. And what they are agreed upon, Democrat and Republican lawyers, is this is not a good case. Okay, mm. so you've already got two people that have been separated out from the RICO and um, they are uh, going to be tried separately. And I tell you what, if either one of those two are found not guilty or acquitted or they aren't found guilty, that, that basically throws into chaos the whole case. And okay. I just think that really what she was trying to do is pull a lot of different things together that had nothing to do with what the question was, which was, was the call from President Trump to Brad Raffensperger appropriate or not. That really should have been mm. the single issue. All the right. other stuff, really just stuff she was trying to throw in there so she could be the star of the show. And it right. has been you know, established already. She was doing fundraising for Democratic candidates. She uh, not go after our Lieutenant Governor because she tried to uh, raise money against him. And so they, they made her recuse herself from him or he would have been included in this group too. So I feel fairly confident in this case that it's not going to go anywhere. Now, will it create havoc for the president's schedule, uh, his right. pocketbook, and other things? But I think as far as a conviction, I just don't think it's going to happen. That's reassuring to hear. Uh, and that's been somewhat of the general consensus that I see coming from the right, of course, the left they're celebrating, but it did seem like she was going for shock and awe with with this, with the RICO Act. And I mean, she got it. Uh, it's definitely an uproar regarding it. So I'm curious with that. Just today, I believe there were three of his co-defendants that are looking to have the charges changed over or the, at least um, the court case changed over into a, a federal level versus state. And they're getting pushback from prosecution. I know that just happened today. Are you aware of it? If so, do you have thoughts on it? Well, I know that there are a number of the uh, defendants that are trying to get changes like that. Um, and look, any kind of picking apart, because the whole part of a RICO case is you have this whole group of people that are tried together. And she was very successful, Fonnie Willis, in the cheating scandal in Atlanta public schools, being able to put people together and do with RICO. Right now, we've got a huge RICO case on sex trafficking that was just filed by the attorney general. So there are appropriate places to use RICO. Right. And it's a great way to get the bad guys. But that's not what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with a lot of people who were merely voicing their opinion or they were lawyers representing clients. And this, mm. is, it, this is another reason why this case is not going to stand up. Because if we end up, if we end up convicting on a case where basically most of the defendants, half of the defendants, were just acting on their own First Amendment rights to have an opinion, 
And right. or secondly, they were advising clients about what to do. That will be, you know, kind of the end of the world there. Right. Yeah, that it it does seem far fetched. And uh, even though they're already getting pushback on it. Well, I, I'm curious, though, what is the strategic gain from having it moved from state to federal? Like you said, breaking uh, it apart. That- it's a higher bar too. I think it's less likely to get a conviction uh, okay. in a federal court. But again, you know, I'm not a lawyer, so I'd have to look at it. But that's what I have heard from the lawyers that I have talked to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Well, I appreciate your opinion on that. Again, George has been in the news so much, and that's your your heavy background is in politics in Georgia. Given everything that you've seen you've been can you break down your career a little bit i know that you you worked directly for your governor in in previous years um, and um, and before that yes yeah, so i did um, radio for a number of years and and political consulting and then in 2012 i ran for congress and i got to the runoff uh and lost in the runoff And then after that, I went to work for Senator David Perdue in his first Senate campaign. And then I headed up his field office. So I worked for the United States Senate for four years. And then uh, I helped Governor Kemp uh, get elected in his first election. And uh, then also stood up his field office. So I traveled all around Georgia. I I traveled 3,000 miles a month. Uh, all over Georgia. Georgia is a gigantic state. It was a great yeah. experience, but I got to meet with people everywhere from South Georgia, North Georgia, East and West, and it was fantastic. And then, um, you know, I really felt like I could help Governor Kemp and the Republican Party more if the state didn't sign my paycheck. So I had an opportunity to go back to work uh, in radio, and I took it. And since then, I have been advising candidates doing media training and helping other Republicans get elected. That's in, that's incredible. What would you say your number one, with everything you've seen, what is the biggest mistake Republicans make when running for office? Um, it's really the messaging. You know, you really, you really need to understand how to, you know, form your message. Okay, so for example, in 2022, we should have had this big, huge, um, you know, win. And um, Roe v. Wade was overturned, which was a great day. I was at the National Right to Life Convention when that decision came down. I I have worked in the pro-life movement for many years, and it was a day that we had been working for for 20 years. And we, the, what we did and how we won is we started winning state legislatures. And through winning state legislatures, we ended up getting a case that went up, the Dobbs case, and allowed Roe v. Wade to be overturned. But instead of actually coming up with a good message related to that, because a lot of women were concerned about that, a lot of those squishy Republican voters were concerned about that, we did not message that um, appropriately. Like for me, you know, it means it goes back to the states. It means that you have more control, that the people that you elect in a district that has 50 or 75,000 people in it are the people that are going to be making the decisions, not some federal person who represents 800,000 to an entire state. So you ought to be happy about this decision being closer to you rather than farther away. So we did a poor job in messaging that. uh, And that is the number one issue because, boy, Republicans love to get in the weeds. We know about policy. We understand one of the things people loved about Donald Trump is he and still love about him is he is very matter of fact. He will answer any question. He doesn't stay on message very well, but that's him. That's what works for him. Um, But, you know, I think that is the number one thing that I have to work with clients about is staying on message and not, and I don't mean that's telling a story or not doing what you're supposed to do, but it's understanding who your audience is and what they want to hear. Right. That is so smart. Knowing your audience is key. It's crucial. I was a campaign manager last year for a senator who was 20 year state senator in Washington state. He took a role uh, under Donald Trump and then he was going to end his career as a local county counselor. And that's what I was the campaign manager for. And we lost by a very small margin, 1200 votes. The painful part was it was a very conservative district, but this was a nonpartisan role. And because there wasn't that R or D next to his name, one, we had a 
ton of undervotes where nobody even voted for that race at all. But the mm. other piece was I was we audited this this race and I was able to see all the ballots and there were clear Republican tickets where they had voted for his opponent. And I truly believe we didn't do a good enough job letting people know his opponent was a Democrat. Instead, we focused right. so much on on him. And so right. it was a great experience. It was trying. And but I learned a ton. And even even he did at his even even though he had been in the, this career for 20 plus years, we learned so much from that. So I'm curious, you know, this this not this specific nonpartisan role is that's just one instance. But I've been seeing a trend where we we see a lot of Democrats pushing for nonpartisan roles at the city and county levels. And I have to believe that it's a strategic move to fool the uneducated voter. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of uh, nonpartisan at the, at the city level, not at the county level, it's by party. Um, and there has been a move to try to make sheriffs nonpartisan, uh, but that has not happened yet. But, you know, I think there's I'm so glad that you worked on a race like that, because I think we focus so much on president and Congress and Senate. Right. But the people that make the decisions that actually impact your life tomorrow are the people that are in the city or the county positions. And, you know, they control your property taxes. They control what you pay in fees. They control all kinds of things. And, you know, a lot of people look at that as a stepping stone. But I think that you've seen in the movement of people running for school board races that it is really important to have good people yes. even in those local races because, yes. you know, they're the people that make the decisions that impact your life immediately and and you don't a lot of times people don't show up at the meetings you don't hear right. about it until it's over and the vote is taken and then you can't yeah. do anything about it exactly and to your point you know one thing i have to say this felt really good three days after she was put into her role his opposition she raised the taxes and i just oh my felt goodness. like i know that's bad of me but we were just kind of like that's what you get for being uneducated and not taking two seconds to actually go figure out who you're voting for um but i, I feel horrible for those people but at the same time it just shows you how disconnected and disengaged they are but you're so right so many people are focused on washington dc and they don't know what's happening right under their noses and it was it was so obvious. Uh, he told me Don Benton is his name. And he said, Kristen, you give the voter way too much credit. And he was right. He was so right. So I, I learned a ton. Well, I was I naive. In a local, you know, the undervotes, I bet in a local race like that, you have people that just vote for the first name. I bet yes. if you looked at it, that there's a benefit of three to five percent for being number one on the ballot. And yes. or if you have incumbent by your name, something like that, because you're right. People don't pay attention and they just fill no. it out. And you're right yeah. that we don't give the voter enough credit. But we sh but at the same time, I guess I'm a little bit of a cockeyed optimist. I, I think that over time you can educate voters. And that's what right. we try to do. That's what I try to do in my radio show. I'm sure you try to do that, too. Yeah. And so hopefully um, you're going to educate people more. Yeah, exactly. It, it has been such a positive experience, though it was painful because you put, as you know, working on an election uh, campaign, it is your life for whatever well, and I'm term telling of you, time it is. It's, it's not, there's nothing harder than um, having to, I lost a race. I had to get out in front of several hundred people that believed in me and, right. and be gracious. And then also do interviews like what does it feel yeah. like you just lost you know and, yeah. and you know you you thought you were best for the race or you wouldn't have run right. but i think that um god has a different plan for me that my right. role is more in helping people get elected than being the elected myself and um in the last 10 years since i ran for office um, my husband's had cancer twice but he's doing great mm -hmm. and um i've had six grandchildren so you know wow. something would have suffered if i was in dc all the time Right, right. I love that outlook because that's how we have to that's how we have to approach things and I completely agree with you. So, I want to I want to touch on something that was also recently in the news and that's Pennsylvania and it sounds like Georgia has something very similar, but that's that 
automatic voter registration. When you go to the DMV, you're getting a driver's license, state ID, you're automatically enrolled to vote. How does that work in Georgia so far? Because I'm hearing a lot of concern coming from the right that this is just another way Democrats are going to try to have the advantage. Let's just, I'll just word it that way. <laughs> now, I think that in the Pennsylvania law, I've read it quickly, is that it you don't opt in, it's automatic. I don't like that, okay? Um, what they do in Georgia is you have to opt in. You get the opportunity okay. when you go to the DMV, and so you have to answer a couple of questions. That's not much of a bar, okay, but at least it's an opt-in kind of situation. So right. what actually happened in Georgia, we had those same concerns about it helping Democrats, but it actually helped Republicans. And ironically, what Stacey Abrams, who is our famous nemesis from Georgia, who runs mm. Fair Fight Georgia, and she does voter registration around the country, she actually didn't like Motor Voter. When she went out and registered people to vote, she did them on paper applications. And the reason why is that people make mistakes on paper applications. And so mm. it clogged up the works so that she had a lot more opportunities to be able to say someone wasn't being treated fairly if you had a paper application. So um, it's a very interesting situation. I think if you have to opt in, it's probably a good thing. If it's automatic, right. it shouldn't be because now in Georgia, you cannot get a driver's license if you are an illegal immigrant. You cannot get a driver's license or a, you know, a, a temporary license or a voter ID card or anything like that. You have to prove that you're a citizen. So um, it's not as big of an issue here, but if it's automatic in Pennsylvania, I would have a problem with that. Yeah, that's and that's what I'm reading it, that it is an automatic. And also it says, I was reading, it says legal permanent residents who are not citizens and people not old enough to vote can also obtain driver's licenses. So if you're not even old enough, which which we all know, you can get one at 16. So I'm curious how how that works. There's got to be. Uh, you would hope that there is a way that that just isn't automatically going over at well, 16 years old. Well, and in California, they allow illegal immigrants to vote in local elections. Um, and at some, to some degree, they allow that also. And I just think that's wrong. I mean, I know that it the is. Constitution is not clear about that. They have they leave a lot of leeway up to localities on the rules they have related to elections. But I just think that's wrong. You should be a citizen of the United States. When I was 18 years old, my father took me to the voter registration office. It was a big day. I took my birth right. certificate. I took my proof of ID. I registered to vote and I have voted ever since. And it ought to be there. It ought to be those proofs, proof of citizenship. Yes, 100%. And that's what you're, the experience that you're, that you're discussing here. It's a, it's a moment of pride. It's a moment of ownership and responsibility. And by having this automatic process, we're taking all of that away and it's become a given, which feeds this entitlement craze that we're seeing, especially with youth right now. Everyone's entitled, everyone is owed something. And so really, I just see this playing right into this problem that we already have. So there's definitely concerns there. It's good to hear that Georgia at least has a few boxes you have to check. It doesn't just require a pulse. <laughs> like like Pennsylvania, but interesting coming out of Pennsylvania, which has been, uh, it's a true swing state and a state that has had a lot of contention in the 2020 race. And uh, I just thought, I found it quite interesting and the timing is interesting as well. Well, and you know, Pennsylvania to me, of all the many cases that were filed after the 2020 election, okay? And there were many of them and not any of them that I know of actually proceeded the way a lot of people hoped that they would. But the Pennsylvania one was a legit case. It was rules that were made by the judiciary as opposed to the legislature because of COVID. And they kind of changed the process in the middle. And mm, I'm, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm boiling it down to more simple language, but that was basically what the situation was there. And that to me is very clearly unconstitutional and should have you know, though that case should have won, but they did not. And so, you know, it's a, it's a lot of issues that are out there. Um, you know, you've got to unfortunately lawyer up if you're running for office and you've got to um, be prepared and have, you know, poll watchers. And that's what I would say to most right. people. If you 
look in your own community to be a poll worker or volunteer to be a poll watcher. You know, one of the big problems in COVID is a lot of the older people were afraid to do the jobs they'd done for 30 years. So you had a whole bunch of new people in addition to a lot of new rules all at the same time. And so, you know, volunteer, be a part of it. Uh, you know, be, be helpful. If you have a question about whether an election's legitimate, volunteer at your local voter office. Right, right. Absolutely. That is so needed. I want to end this with about three minutes left. We briefly touched on a message of hope and action. So many people are disengaged because they feel that, that like you said, everything's been mapped out already for, for 2024. Talk to us about, give us a message of hope and action and, and that we still need to turn up and vote. Absolutely, because nobody knows what's going to happen. I mean, you know, the Democrats have made their convention the latest possible date they can. And normally when you have an incumbent president, you have it early. They're not sure if Joe Biden is going to make it all the way. So don't assume it's going to be a rematch of Joe Biden and Donald Trump and then not go out to vote. Okay, look at the candidates, decide who you're going to vote for, um, rally, be a part of it, do all those things but go and vote because not a single vote has been cast. And I have a real uh, concern about polling in the, in the age of cell phones, you know, because I don't answer a lot of calls that I don't recognize. So right. polling is suspect. And the only poll that matters is the one that you go vote at. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I've never gotten a single call <laughs> with my opinion being asked. So I'm like, who are they polling? I don't understand this. All right. We do have a minute left. I want to ask you for those who live in a state, those like myself who are on the left coast here, and we live in a state of mail-in voting. There are a lot of people here that aren't voting any longer because they feel that their votes aren't being cast. Anything you can say to those folks? Well, let me tell you something. There were 430,000 Republican voters that did not turn out for the runoff in Georgia in 2021. And it is the reason mm -hmm. why the Senate flipped to Democrat. You should yeah. always vote. You're not teaching someone a lesson by staying home. OK, right. you need to vote and you need to get involved. And, you know, I try to, to tout that message. You can go to MarthaZoller.com and see all the things that I do. I have a radio program. I have a podcast. Uh, most of the things you read about me online are true. They're not all, but <laughs> but you I can listen it. to me for yourself. <laughs> but the but the thing is, I know who I am, so I don't care what I read about myself. I don't care what somebody says about me on Twitter. I don't care about any of that kind of stuff because I know who I am, and I know what I stand for, and that's what's really important. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much, and thank you for outlining where people can find you. Are you also on social media? Yes, it's at Martha Zoller on Twitter. It's, um, you know, I'm on threads. I'm on True Social. I'm everywhere. Perfect. Excellent. Wonderful. Well, I Real really name. appreciate you being on. <laughs> All right. I love it. Yeah, I verified. Real name. Uh, I know. I just finally came out with my real name, too. So, and uh, along with that, I went and bought some like security system where they take you off of every website <laughs> that happens. But, anyways, thank you so much for coming on. And someone like you, someone like me, we were born for times like these. Sometimes I'm sure you wonder, I wonder, wow, really? Couldn't I be around in the 50s? or somewhere, it sometimes seems easier than this time, but everything you're doing, you're so bold and strong and and just have a really honest voice. So thank you very much for everything you're doing and um, for this, this message of courage and action. Thanks, Kristen. Oh, absolutely. All right, everyone, thank you so much for tuning into KSOC Uncensored. We will see you next Thursday.